Good morning. Good morning. Okay, good morning, all my students. Please now allow me to come to my desk. Good morning. Okay, the good. Uh, we are going to continue the lecture. Remember, we are still in the session on what? In the section on the appreciation of will. Uh, actually, we have covered so many things, remember, uh, when uh, we deal with situations uh, in which the will of the party may be appreciated, okay, for uh, some uh, reasons, okay. Uh, remember, we have seen the situation where uh, the will of the party is hidden, okay, and we also we have also seen the situation uh, regarding a fictitious intention, also uh, regarding a fictitious intention, okay, which is intended to conceal and then to, to risk acts, okay. And just last week we talked about, you know, the principle of law, uh, principle of law regarding fraud, right, and uh, I think uh, today we are going to move on to consider two situations. The first one, it is situations uh, involving jurors, okay, jurors, or in Thai, Hong Ku. And the second one, uh, maybe when the, it, this is going to be dealt with in the second half of the lecture this morning, uh, we will uh, look at the principle of law regarding mistake, or in Thai, Kwam, Sam, Khan, Pit. Okay, so the Let's move on to consider the first one, the doctrine or the principle of law, the principle of jurors, okay, or Gan Kung Ku. Uh, before I start, let me just uh, use this device to see, okay, I have an online classroom. Again, I'm going to just take the questions, and uh, if you would like to ask questions or if you would like to make some comments, okay, you will, can just send your messages to. Uh, the online classroom, and I'm going to see your messages, your messages uh, via this tablet. Okay, please allow me a few seconds. Okay, to uh, come to you know the our online classroom through this tablet. Just one moment, please. Just one moment. Okay. Okay, I now see myself here okay, on this tablet. Alright, so if you have any questions, okay, and uh, or if you would like to make some comments, please send your, your messages to me, okay, I'm going to see your messages uh, via this tablet, okay, and uh, if I can answer the que your questions on time, then I will do so. If I cannot just answer your questions on time, then I'm going to do so later, okay, after uh, at the end of the lecture, okay? <clears throat> Good, right now we are going to embark on uh, the principle of law, uh, the principles of jurors, okay, jurors of Gan Kung Ku in Thai, okay? What is it when we talk about jurors? When we talk about jurors, okay, that uh, it is just a threat. The threat which is asserted by one party okay, on another party, okay, and uh, that is intended to do what? The threat is asserted with an intention to lead the other party, okay, to lead the other party to uh, to the conclusion of a juristic act. To put simply, okay, the A makes a juristic act with B and A forces B, okay, to do so. In fact, we may not want to make this juristic act. The, the reason why we decide to enter into this juristic act because it is because of the threats exerted by A. Okay, so in this situation, we can see that the will, okay, the will of the party, the will of the other party is not free. A and B makes a juristic act. And A exerts, okay, the exerts the threats on B in this case, 
the wheel the wheel on the part of B is not free okay the without a tracks then B the will not make this to react at all okay so we can see that you know the, the wheel the wheel of the other party the, the wheel of the threatened party it is overboard okay so in this situation we may say that it is a situation which involves the overboard will okay overboard mean what overboard mean that it is not free okay it is in some way okay it is it is procured okay in some way by a uh, compulsion okay so this is the nature of jurors okay so when it is a threat this threat may be in many forms okay it may be in a form of what it may be in a form of you know the the of uh, I mean the making it the making or causing the fear the fear of losing the life okay look at this example we have let's say a and b again in this case a point okay a points again at b z in order to force b to sign a contract with a or let's say to sign a document okay under which a under which b transfers all b shares in let's say in a company or in a five-star hotel to a in this case the transfer is made by by b to a because of a threat a threatens the b that if b does not transfer b shares in this uh, hotel right then a will just shoot it should be we can see that in this case when b signed this document transferring his shares okay to a that is not that is not the result of you know more more intelligence but it is it is caused by the fear, the fear of loss of life. If B does not want to make a transfer of the chest to A, then A will shoot B to death. In this case, it is when this just the act the transfer, okay, it is caused it is caused under duress. See? The duress in this case is in the form of you know causing the fear of the lo of the loss of life. But sometimes we can also see, you know, the threats or duress in the form of causing fear, fear of the suffering some, the, you know, some loss or death, loss of or damage to the property. Let's go that again. We have A and B. Let's go that A is a builder. Okay, he wants to have some contracts. So A, the builder, just threatens. Threaten to do what? Threaten to burn down B's hotel. Let's just say that B is the hotel owner, okay? And A, the builder, wants to have a contract, okay, with B. A does threaten B that if B does not want to sign a construction contract with A, then A, the builder, will do what? A will just set a fire to this hotel. So in this case, B is in fear, the fear of, you know, the, the fear of loss, okay, of this property, not loss of life as the example number one here, but B is in fear of losing what? In fear of losing, okay, that this hotel, because A exerts a threat, okay, against B, that if B does not allow A, okay, to have a contract with B, then A will set point to this hotel. Okay, it is on say you know the case of jurors. So it is the threats exerted by one party on the other party in order to in order to lead the other party, the party, the the threat party to the conclusion of a juristic act. Right. And another example is this one. Just note from the example of the from the example number one, we can see the case of, you know, the, the case of a threat. A threat, the, a threat to, a threat of what? A threat causing the loss of life. And also a threat causing the loss of property. Now, we can see the example involving a threat causing the loss of reputation, okay? Let's suppose that we have A and B again. 
Let's say that Bay, he is a director okay, of the company. And he has he has had some affairs with his secretary with his secretary. He thinks that nobody knows anything about this, but the thing is that A happens to know this know this fact. A wants to you know they want to have some benefit. So A does threaten B that if B does not want to execute a will bequeathing B's you know, house to A, then A will reveal to people you know, the, the facts about when the sexual affair between B and his secretary, okay? So in this case, B does not want anyone to know about this truth. So when A exerts a threat on B like this, B is put in the fear, fear of what? Fear of losing his reputation, okay? So in this case, B makes a will, B does execute a will with quit, bequeathing his house to A. Okay, so the will, the will which is executed by B in A's favor, it is made under duress. So that, in this case, we can see that, okay, that the will or the will mean the intention, okay, the intention on the part of B, it is overboard. So it, this is a case of, you know, the overboard will, the will, the intention is not the free one, okay? It is, it is, it is, you know, the, it is under duress. Right. So the, in this case, we can see that when the will of the party is not genuine, then the law should not give legal effect to the to the gap in question. Okay, so now we come to this question: What is going to be the legal consequence of jurors? If we look in the CCC, in this case, in the case where a jurors gap is made under jurors, if it is made under jurors, then. The, the, the jury's gap in question will become voidable. Okay, this is the consequence in section 164, paragraph 1. 164, paragraph 1 provides as follows. The declaration of an intention under jurors is voidable. So you, you, we, you will have to uh, check and know that, you know, the, in some situations, a uh, jury's gap becomes void. In some situations, the jurisdic act in question becomes just voidable, okay? So do not mix up between the two, okay? Because there are different consequences of, uh, you know, between, okay? The jurisdic act which is void and the one which is voidable. We will, uh, you know, the defend our discussion on, on this point in the, maybe in the next two, next uh, uh, Monday lecture, okay? Now, right. It does not mean that okay, all threats will lead to the Jurassic Act becoming voidable. In order for a Jurassic Act to become voidable on the ground of jurists, there are requirements, two important requirements. The requirement as to imminence and the requirements as to severity. With, the, with respect to the first one, the element of, you know, the in, in imminence, in this case, the threat in question must cause an imminent harm or imminent danger to the to the other party. Okay, and with respect to the second element, the element of severity. Okay, the threat in question must be so severe as to lead the other party to be in fear. Okay, so remember two elements. The first one is imminence, the second one is you know sever severity of harm. Okay. Without the jurors, the Jurassic in question would not have been met. Right. So these two requirements are indeed embodied in section one six four, paragraph two, which provides as follows jurors which renders an act to be voidable must be one which yeah. the first one is 
causes a danger that is imminent. Okay, this is the first requirement. The requirement of what? The requirement of uh, imminence, okay? And so, so we're as to lead the threatened party to be in fear. See, so this is the second one. Okay, severity. Without which the, the act in question would not have been met. See, so if one of these elements is absent, okay, just mean that the jurisdiction act in question will not become voidable on the ground of duress at all. Okay, look at this example with respect to the requirement as to imminence, okay? Let's put that we have again A and B. A does exert a threat on B. A forces B to transfer B's shares to A. A said, well, B, transfer your share to me, otherwise I will, I will just at attack your son next week. <coughs> You know, B has a very lovely son, and B is, of course, as a father, he loves his son very much. Right. So A does threaten B that B, if you do not want to, you know, transfer, if you do not, you do, if you don't transfer your shares to me, then I'm going to attack your son next week because I know that your son is going to school next week. Okay. The next week. It is going to be the end of the vacation so that your son will be back to school and I'm going to just, you know, attack your son very seriously next week. In this case, we can see that, okay, if we talk about imminence of harm, the harm in question is not imminent. Given that, okay, the attack will be taking place not now but next week. So that there is no imminence of harm here. So if if B transfers B shares to A, in this case, can be can be argued that the transfer is you know the word hope on the ground of duress. The answer is no. Why? Why not? Because the element of imminence is simply absent. Okay, the element of imminence is missing here. Okay. In order for a jurisdiction act to become voidable on the ground of duress, the harm in question must be imminent. That means that it must be very, very near. Next week, in this case, okay, the harm which is going to take place next week doesn't seem to be, in fact, apparently it does not. Okay, it does not become the imminent at all. So that in this case, when the element of imminence is simply missing, okay, so that this jurisdiction act, i.e. the transfer of shares from B to A, it is not voidable on the ground of jurors, okay, simply because the element of imminence is just missing, okay. And with respect to the, the element of what? The element of severity of harm, let me just give you an example here. Again, we have A and B. A exerts a threat on B. B has a car, and uh, this is the car, the, the car, okay, the, the car of great pride. Right. B loves this car very much, okay? B does not want to sell this car to anyone. Right. But the thing is that A wants to have B's car. You know that you know that B does not want to sell this car to to A at all, so A does exert a threat on B and say, "Well, B, you have to just sell your car to me, otherwise I'm going to throw rotten eggs on your car. I will just throw you know rotten eggs on your car, and your car will you know will just uh, be uh, will, your car will get dirty. I know that you love your car very much." You cannot stand, okay, seeing your car in the, you know, the, in, in this dirty stage, like this. So in this case, let's suppose that B is in fear of his car being dirty, okay, because of this rotten eggs. So B does, you know, B agree to sell the car to A in this case. We have a contract of sale between A and B here. Can B... 
when B, you know, there is no longer under trust, can be said, sorry, Minda, this contract, the sale contract, a contract of sale between you and me, well, uh, it is it is just voidable because it is procured, it is made under jurors. In this case, even though it is, it is jurors, but this jurors does not cause severe harm. If we get back to what section 1664 paragraph 2 say, Okay, jurors which renders an act to be voidable must be one which causes a danger that is imminent and so severe as to lead the threatened party to be in fear. So, the key word is severity or severe here. Can we say that, you know, this stress is so severe? The stress of what? The stress of, you know, causing the stress of causing what? Causing the, the causing the car to be dirty like this. It is it is is that so severe? The answer is it is negative, okay? The answer is no. The harm here is not so severe. So that okay, the the contract in question, the jersey act in question, okay, i.e. a sale uh, the contract of sale between A and B A and B, sorry does not become voidable on the ground of duress at all simply because the element of severity of harm is just missing okay of course when we consider when we consider whether you know the harm in question is severe okay so severe as to put you know the party the other party okay in 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 fear we have also to consider the mental condition of the party who is threatened, okay? Because consideration of the mental condition of the party of the threatened party is okay, it is required by section one six one six eight. Sorry, one six seven here. Section one six seven provides as follows in determining in determining a case involving a mistake, fraud, and jurors. In fact, in this provision, Section 167 applies to cases of mistake, jurors, and fraud as well. Not only jurors, it also applies to mistake and fraud as well. But now we talk, we talk about in the case of jurors. So in order to consider whether or not whether or not you know the the jurisdiction in question is made an a jurist, but we have to consider what section one hundred six seven say regard shall also be had to the gender, age, position, health, and mental condition of the declarer of the intention and other circumstances as well as surroundings. Put it into the act in question. So, put simply, we have to take everything into consideration, including the conditions attending the threatened party, and also, you know, all other, you know, circumstances of the case. So, if we get back to this example, okay, the, let's suppose that we. B said, well, you know, I, I have, you know, I have, I love this car very much. And my love for this car is extraordinary. I cannot stand, you know, seeing my car, you know, the being dirty like that. Can A say that, well, the threats in question is so severe? The answer is, even though section 167, okay, <coughs> ask us to consider also the mental conditions. But I believe that, you know, the... If B has such extraordinarily okay, sensitive mind like that, I don't think that when B can have an excuse because we will have to also compare okay, the with the people in general. In this kind of case, I don't think that people in general will be in fear. If you just threaten your friend that, well, if your friend does not want to sell your friend's car to you, then you will have to you will throw rot rotten eggs on your friend's car. I don't think that your friend will, will 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 be frightened. Okay, your friend will not be put in fear. Okay, so in this case, it is quite 
part or B in this case to argue that he is put in fear. Right. Even though you know section 167 requires us to consider mental condition of the declarer of the intention, but I think that this is also subject to you know a limit of sensibility. Right. So that in this case the answers is just that B, if we get back to this question, okay, B cannot argue that this agreement or this contract between A and B is voidable on the ground of jurors. Okay. The reason why it is not voidable on the ground of jurors is because this jurors does not cause the harm which is so severe as to put the trade as to put the present party in fear. Right. So that the element of the element of sever severity is just missing, okay? Now we are going to consider the jurors which is which is caused by a third party. Just now we talk about a situation where you know the a just gap is made between A and B and A exerts a threat on B. But what about you know what about the situation where the threat it is not it is not caused by B or oh, so caused by A, but it is caused by somebody else. It is it is caused by a third party. A and B when they make a choosing act. There is no threat from the part of A at all. There is no threat from the part of B, but the threat it is exerted by somebody else. The threat is caused by C, who is a third party. In this case, what is going to be the legal consequence of this choosing act, which is made between A and B? Okay. Remember when we discussed the principle of law regarding the regarding fraud? We also consider the case where fraud is fraud is committed by a third party. Remember, let's say we have, again we have A, B, and C. The contract or the jurisdiction act is made between A and B, but it is made okay. It is procured by fraud committed by C. In the case of fraud, we have seen already from our discussion last week that okay. In the case of fraud by a third party, the jurisdiction act between the parties, i.e. A and B here, will become voidable only when the other party, let's say that, okay, A does sell a house to B because of the fraud committed by C. In this case, okay, let's say that C has told a lie to A about this, about something, okay, and A relies on the statement given by C, and A just sells the house to B in reliance on some facts told by C, okay, that is a that is a lie told by C, okay, the false statements. In this case, the contract is made between A and B because of the fraud committed by C. The law say that, maybe, you know, A does not know anything about the fraud committed by a third party. So in this case, we will have to protect A if A knows nothing about, you know, the fraud committed by a third party. So remember, the law say that the jurisdiction act between A and B will be voidable on the ground of fraud committed by a third party only when the other party, in this case it is A, only when the other party knows about the fraud commit, sorry, knows about the uh, no, knows about the fraud, yes, committed by the third party. If A does not know anything about the fraud committed by third party, then A will have to be protected by law. The choosing act between A and B will not become voidable. But now we talk about the case of jurors. Is this is the treatment by the law the same? I if you know that. The jurisdiction act, it is made under jurors by a third party. Let's suppose that we have a contract between A and B, but the contract between A and B is made because of the jurors by C. 
in this case, do we have to consider the knowledge of the other party? Okay, look at this example here. Okay, we have A, B, and C here. Let's suppose that A, he sold his house to B. Right, A sold his house to B. In fact, A does not want to, A never you know, wanted to sell his house to B. But the reason why A sold his house to B is because right. C, who is in fact, but you see, who is in fact B's boyfriend, okay, exert a threat on A. C does point at a gun as A's head. C tells A, A, if you don't want to sell your house to B, then I'm going to shoot you now. So in this case, A is in fear. So, okay, when A okay, was in fear like this, A sold this house to B because he had the fear of losing his life because of the threats by C, not by B. In this case, do we have to consider the knowledge on the part of, a, of B? Do we, can we just say that if B know nothing about the threats committed by C, then B will have to be protected by law? As in the case of fraud, the answer is no. In this case, the law gives different treatment the treatment which is different from the case of the fraud committed by a third party. In the case of jurors committed by a third party, the law does not. You know, the, the law does not require us to you know to consider the knowledge of a third party. So back to this this example. When A sold his house to B because of the threats. On the part of C, right. The let's suppose that the two elements I first the what the imminence of harm. Secondly, the severity, and I, I think that these two elements are, you know, they are present here. You know, because this harm is very serious. The harm, you know, the the fear of what losing the life. This is very very serious, and this. Harm is imminent because C, C would shoot A to death at that moment, not in the future. Right. In this case, even though B had no knowledge about this threat or this duress committed by C, it does not matter. Whether or not B had the knowledge of the threats by the third party, that is immaterial. The law says that the Jurisdiction Act in question, the Jurisdiction Act which is made under duress by a third party will always become voidable. Right. This is the consequence which is pronounced by law in section 166 of the Civil and Commercial Code. According to 166, duress renders the declaration of an intention to be voidable even if the duress is exerted by a third person, see? So the law does not require us to consider the, the, the knowledge on the part of the other party. What's the reason? The reason here is that duress, the duress case, it is considered as far more serious than the case involving fraud. So even though in the case of fraud committed by a third party, the law requires that the jury act becomes voidable only when you know the other party knows about the jury, sorry, the fraud. But in the case of jurors, it is something far more serious. So you know a jury act which is made at a jurors even committed by a third party will always become voidable irrespective of whether or not the other party knows about that jurist as committed by the third person, okay? 
So if we compare between two cases, okay, the case involving jurors and the case involving fraud, we can see you know different treatments under the law. With respect to jurors committed by third party, the jurisdiction in question will become voidable. Uh, respective of the donor shop via the other party, but in the case of fraud committed by a third person, then the jurisdiction in question will become voidable only when the other party knew or ought to have known of that fraud. See, so the, you should not mix up between you know the this treatments by the law, okay? In the case involving jurors and in the case involving fraud. Okay, as regards, you know, the duress of fraud committed by a third person, okay? Now, we come to, you know, the, the, the final part of uh, this uh, lecture regarding, you know, the doctrine or the principle of duress in Thai law. We have seen the nature of duress and we have also seen, you know, the essential elements, okay, the, which make a act voidable on the ground of jurors. Remember two elements. The elements regarding what? The elements concerning imminence and uh, the element regarding you know, severity of harm, okay? Even though you know those two elements are present, but in some cases the law, Thai law, does not regard the jurors in question as jurors, even though it is a threat, but Thai law does not regard it as jurors not regarded as jurors. Okay, the top, I should say that the Thai law seems to be narrower, narrower than the laws in the other countries. Let's say the English law. There are differences between English law and Thai law on the point of jurors, fraud and mistake. Okay, the, at the end of the lecture on Thai law, at the end of the lectures on principles of Thai law on the duress, mistake, and fraud, we are going to discuss the uh, comparable, okay, the doctrines in English law, okay, and please bear in mind that I mean, this comparison is very important because it's going to be included in your midterm examination as well. You are going to give an account of you know, the differences between Thai law and English law, okay, the invo uh, involving, you know, the, the cases of jurors, fraud, and mistakes. But we will I mean, look at English law later, okay, maybe the next week. Right. Or after next week, we, we will have two more sessions, teaching sessions, okay before your midterm examination, I think that time is going to be sufficient for us to explore some elements of English law okay, with respect to fraud, duress and mistake. In fact, English law does not have the doctrine of fraud, they have the doctrine of misrepresentation. Okay, Let's talk about that in the later, okay? Not now. Now, coming back to Thai law, there are some tracks which are not regarded by Thai law as jurors, that means that even though even though the jurisdiction in question is made under jurors, okay, but the jurisdiction act will, will the jurisdiction act will not become voidable on the ground of jurors because Thai law does not regard it as jurors. But there are these two cases these two scenarios in which Thai law does not regard the threats in question as jurors. The first one it is the threats. A threat to resort to the normal exercise of a right. The second one it is the you know threats of the threats which causes you know which causes reverential reverential fear. Sorry, let's I mean, uh, let's uh, look at this. Okay, let's look at this uh, the, in the detail now. These two situations are addressed by section 165 of the civil and commentary code. According to 165, 
I stress to resort to the normal exercise of aeroid is not regarded as jurors. This is what he is said in paragraph 1. And paragraph 2 goes on to state and any act carried out on account of reverential fear is not, again, it is not. Regarded as an act carried carry out under jurors. Okay. The, the threats to resort to the normal exercise of a right. It is known as in Thai, okay, in the Thai, in the Thai language, it is known as And the second one, okay, the second one, a threats. Okay. Which causes reverential fear. It is known as okay the quam not to young brain. So in these two situations, even though let's say that a contract or any other juicy act is made okay as a result of a threat, Thai law does not regard it as jurist so that the party who is threatened cannot have any remedy. Now we start with the first one. Okay. We start with the first one. What is the first one? A threat to resort to the normal exercise of a right. What is the what is that? A threat to resort to the normal exercise of a right. It is the threat to exercise a right which which the threatening party has under the rule. That means that when A exert a threat on B Okay, A, ex, A just threaten B to exercise some rights which A has under the law. So when A has that right under the law, okay, it should not be considered as a threat which gives right to any remedy. Okay, it should not, it should not lead to, you know, it should not, you know, lead to the contract becoming voidable because A has that right, okay, under the law. Maybe he has that right under the law or under the contract. So when A has that right, if A threatens B that if B does not want to do something, then A will ex exercise that right. That is not a threat. That is not the jurist in Thai law because it is just, you know, the, the, the resort to the normal exercise of a right. In this case, let's have a look at you know the many examples which I bring to your attention here. In the first case, let's go that we have a, we have a bank, a commercial bank, okay, and we have an old man. Okay, the, the thing is that let's suppose that this old man has a son, okay, and his son commits. His son has committed a criminal offense. Let's say that his son just committed forgery. Of course, forgery it is a criminal offense. Okay, so his son can be okay put in jail because his son has committed this criminal offense. So in this case, the bank who is the victim of this offense, the bank just does not want to. In fact, the bank does not want to put this. To put him in the this old man's sons in jail, but the bank think this way. The bank said, "Okay, we know that when this old man, he cares very much about his son. Okay, he does not want his son to, you know, to to be put in jail. Obviously, so the bank just exerts a threat on this old man. The bank say, "Well, the Mister the uh, Mister what, Mister Pravin." I know that your son has done something wrong. Okay, your son has committed forgery, which is a criminal offense. We, the bank, we can just institute a criminal action against your son. If you do not want your son to be, you know, taken legal, legal proceedings, can you do this? You can just sign a guarantee in favor of the bank. You can just sign a guarantee in favor of the bank. Right. So in this case, this old man does make 
the contract with the bank, i.e. the guarantee, okay? Agreeing, the son agrees to act as the guarantor okay, in favor of this bank. Right. So in this case, when the father, the old man here, has signed this guarantee, agreeing to act as the guarantor for, you know, the, for the, you know, the debt of the son in favor of the bank, can the, this old man say that, sorry, I'm not going to be liable under this guarantee because this guarantee is made under duress. It has been made, it has been made under duress so that it is voidable. And I would like to avoid this agreement right now. Can the old man do this? The answer is no. Because in this case, we have a threat by the bank, of course. The bank just resort to what? It is a threat. The threat, if we could get back to the, the first that you know the the, the the first case. It is the threat of what? A threat to resort to the normal exercise of a right. In this case the bank has the right to just institute the criminal action against the son. So when the bank does exert the threats over this old man, it is not jurors in Thai law because it is just the threats to resort to the normal exercise of a right, the right under the law. So this is not regarded as jurors. In fact, we also have, you know, some real examples from the, the, the Supreme Court cases, okay? Look at example number, number two. Okay. In the example number two, here, if your slide is different from what you say on screen now, okay, do not be surprised because I have made correction, okay, of something, okay. I have just been given more details I mean, uh, of this case, okay. In this example number two, it is also an example of a threat to resort to the normal exercise of a right. In this case, we, we have the hotel, a hotel, and the PEA. PEA, it is a state enterprise. PEA, it is country in Thailand. It is the Provincial Electricity Authority. The Provincial Electricity Authority, okay, or PEA. Right. Oh, in Thai, God, Fai, Fa, So, and Pumi, Pa. All right. So, of course, the PEA just supplies electricity to householders, including, you know, the, including the, the co corporate, co co uh, corporate entities, okay. So, in this case, the hotel, of course, the hotel would have to, you know, would have to consume electricity. So, the contract in question was the contract of sale of electricity. Okay, between the hotel and the PAA, and this contract contained the contractual provisions allowing the PEA to stop the supply of electricity immediately in the case where you know the hotel did not make payment of you know make payment of electricity fee. So in this case, on a good day, you know the hotel was in error. The hotel did not pay for the electricity, you know, the fee, so that the PEA was in trouble. The PEA, therefore, gave the notice to the hotel, demanding payment by the hotel, and the notice also contained the indication that the PEA intended to stop the supply of electricity if payment was not made by the hotel. So, you know, the hotel was in fear. The hotel, therefore, subsequently, the hotel just made a written acknowledgement of debt. The written acknowledgement of debt, we in Thai, we call this one, Nang Su Rap Sapap Ni. Nang Su Rap Sapap Ni, okay? After, you know, the conclusion of this, after, you know, after making this written acknowledgement of debt, the hotel just contended that that acknowledgement of debt was made under jurist and therefore became voidable. The 
question which arose is whether or not, you know, that this Curiosity Act, i.e. the acknowledgement of debt, was voidable because of jurors. Right. It was here by the Supreme Court that this A, this A, D, the acknowledgement of debt, okay, this acknowledgement of debt was not voidable because this threats. It was the threat to resort to the normal exercise of a right, remember, under this contract, this PEA, the Provincial Electricity Authority, had the right to stop the supply of the electricity in the case of failure to pay the fee by householders. Okay, so the PEA had the right under the contract to do so, i.e. to discontinue the supply of electricity. So when the hotel just threatened to do so, when the, sorry, not the hotel, when the PEA threatened to stop the supply of electricity, that was just a threat to resort to the normal exercise of the right. So that the acknowledgement of debt in question was not voidable on the ground of jurors simply because Thai law did not consider that as jurors. It was again it was the it was a threat to resort to the normal exercise of a right in this case the right under the contract. Okay, so in this case the hotel just lost his case. Hotel just lost means his case. Now, we have a few more examples, okay, that involving the threats to resort to the normal exercise of a right. Look at this example number three here. I try to simplify you know, the facts by when putting you mean, the important facts into this diagram. Let's suppose that we have A, B, and A is fallen. In this case, what happens is, what happens Okay, that was the following. A, borrow money from B. So in this case, A, was the borrower, B, was the lender. And A also stole some property from B. So A, in fact, okay, A, in fact, was at fault in two respects. The first one is that A did not repay B. And secondly, A just committed theft. A stole you know, property from B, so that was a criminal offence, the offence of theft. Under section 1, under, under section 3, 3, 4 of the Penal Code, remember. I think that you have, or oh, you are now studying, you know, uh, you are now taking, you know, criminal law courses, courses as well. So you know that when A takes property from B, you know, there was some I mean, the, uh, dishonest intent. Right. When A this, 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 sorry, when A, okay, takes away property from another person with, you know, their uh, dishonest intent, with dishonest intent, that is, yeah, that is the offense of theft under the penal code, okay? So, in this case, what happened next is that, right, A, the criminal, right, was put into custody at the police station, okay, so, a was detained in, you know, at the police station, okay? So, a father was in trouble, of course. Every father, you know, that left the son, okay? So, in this case, B, B just been the, B, been the, B just had a deal with A's father, okay? B just requested the A's father to, to, to make what? To make a memorandum of agreement, or the, we can just use the word MA here for a memorandum memorandum of agreement, okay? Under this MA, okay, A's father's promise to make repayment to B. Right. Of course, when A owe money to B and A also would have to compensate B for the loss which is which was occasioned by the theft committed by A against B, correct? So in this case, the memorandum of agreement 
Require A s father to to do what? To just make repayment to B in the amount. Okay, in the amount the representing the loss caused by A against B. So we have the M A between whom and whom. We have a jurisdic act. The jurisdic act, i.e., the memorandum of agreement between A's fathers and B. After that, after the conclusion of the MA, A's father contended that this MA was made under jurors so that it would be voidable. Right. So in this case, the Supreme Court did not agree with A's father. It was held that no, it was not jurors because it was just a threat to resort to the normal exercise of a right because in this case, B had the right to press a charge against A. B has the right, under the law, okay, to just, you know, take legal, legal proceedings against A. Right. So when B just exerted on A's father a threat, like this, it was just a threat to resort to the normal exercise of a right. Okay, the Supreme Court said that, you know, it was a threat to resort to the normal ex exercise of a right under section 127. 127, it is 127 when the order date of the, the you know, order date on which this case was here was I mean, decided by the court. Now, section 127 has become section 165 at present, okay? So, uh, in conclusion, the Supreme Court considered that the threats this way, it was the threat to, you know, it was a threat to resort to the normal exercise of a right. You can say that it was not anti law, it was not regarded as jurist. So, the MA in question here, the, mem the memorandum of agreement. Concluded between A fathers and B here was therefore valid. It was not voidable on the ground of duress at all. Again, I mean, we have you know the case like this again, uh, in another, yeah. in another the Supreme Court case, right in the two thousand seven. Okay. Again, for I mean, for the sake of the simplicity, I try to just digest important facts. And demonstrate it, and then demonstrate the facts in the form of this diagram. We have A, B, we have A and B here. What happened is that A he drew a check, so that A was the drawer, the check drawer or in Thai Fu Sang Jai. Okay, he drew a check for B. B was the draw, draw V, draw V, okay, pull up good. in Thai, okay. So in this country, in Thailand, we, we have had a special act known as the Act on, the Act on Offenses from the Use of Checks. Oh, in Thai, Pratimanyat, Wadoi Kwam Pit Gan Chai Shek. In essence, this act, this act imposes criminal criminal liability for a person who draws a check, knowing that there is knowing that I mean, the, there is no money in the account. If you just draw a check, knowing that in your account there is no money left at all, or there is the money which is not sufficient for the check, then you will commit an offense. The offense under this act, okay? So in this case, A drew this check for B and when this check could not be paid by the bank because there was no, there was no, there was not sufficient money left. We can just say that this check was dishonored to Prisaka China because no money or Okay, there was insufficient money in the account. Right. So again, this is an offense 
and often under the act on offenses from the use of checks. It is, of course, a criminal offense, so that A can just be taken legal, legal proceedings. In this case, B just exerted threats on A. B said, well, A, we, I know that when you have now committed you know, an offense, I can just mean I can just go ahead with with a criminal action against you if you do not want to if you do not want you know the mis if you do not want to have any mis any misfortune from what you have done wrong why don't you do this you can just make an agreement with me so you can just sign an agreement with me under which you promise to just repay me so now you know we have a little agreement between between a and b b force a to just make a little agreement with b if a did not want to do so then b would have to take a legal action against a okay the, because a had committed an offense under this act on offenses from the use of the checks Okay, the, the act on offenses for the use of the checks. Sorry, for, for the use of checks. Correct. In this case, the question which arose here, okay, the before the court, is what? Whether or not the threats in this fashion would be regarded as jurors and would make the loan agreement here voidable. It was held by the Supreme Court that this was simply a threat to resort to the normal exercise of a right. Okay, so that it is not regarded by Thai law as jurist. So that this choosing act, i.e. the law agreement between A and B here, was not voidable on the ground of jurist. We again have one more example from this, this case, in the example number five here. Okay, this is also argument drawn from the, the Supreme Court case in the 2010, okay. In this case, we have A and B. Again, I try to just mean convert the complex, the complex act, oh, sorry, the facts into a very simple diagram here. Again, we have A and B. The thing is that A rented, you know, rented a property here, rented a car from B. So in this case, A was a lessee, Pu Chao, and B was the lessor, Pu Hai Chao. If in this case, A as the lessee, he had no ownership in this car. He could just use this car under the contract. I mean, the lease, of course. What happened is that even though he, even though A had no ownership in this car, this let's say just pledged this car with the pledge. The pledge, pledge is what in Thai we call jam nam. A just pledged this car with the pledge, even though he had no right to do so. So when A did that, in criminal law, you know that A, at that time, he did not have ownership in, in this car, but he does, you know, he just possessed this car. So when his car was in his possession, he just placed his car with the black sheet. So this is the offense. We call this offense the misappropriation or yak yak stuff. Right? So this is, of course, a, crim a criminal offense again. And what happened is that, okay, the B, the victim, okay, just lodged a complaint with the police. He just indicated his intention to take a criminal action against A, okay, the, in the charge of misappropriation. Oh, yeah, you have Right. Of course, you know that when this offense is what? This offense is a compatible offense. 
a compatible offense. It is the offense which, which is capable of settlement by the parties. Okay. So in this case, if A and B does enter into settlement, this criminal, this criminal action will come to an end. Okay. Because the law says that this offense it is a compatible of offense of quam pit and your quam that. So in this case, B it had the right to do what? B had the right to just you know had the right to just bring legal proceedings against A. Right. After that, B know that you know A A A to mom A mothers would have to be in trouble, but the mother would the mother loved the son very much. So B just told the mother. B just told A's mother and asked A mother to do what? To conclude a loan agreement. Under which B's mothers okay, agreed to repay sorry, not B mother. A's mother. A's mother under this loan agreement agreed to repay B the sum equivalent to the liability on the part of A against B. So everything, every the loss, in every loss suffered by, by B would have to be remedied by A's mother under this one agreement. If A's mother did not want to make this one agreement, then B would go ahead with you know the a criminal charge against A. So we have the agreement between B and A's mother. A's mother later claimed that this agreement was made at a jurist and therefore became voidable on the ground of jurist. It was held by the, the, the Supreme Court that it was not jurist at a Thai law. So the the act in question, i.e. The, the loan agreement here, did not become voidable because this threat, what it threats to resort again, to resort to the normal exercise of a right under section 165 of the civil and Communist Code of Thailand, okay? So the, you can see that, you know, that in this country, we, you know, we have some limitations, limitations to you know, the doctrine of the jurors in Thai law. We can see later, you know, when we deal with the, the, the power of the doctrine of jurors in English law, we can see that English law seems to afford a greater level of protection okay, to the victim. Okay. In some cases, right. in some situations, the jurors or the, the threats in question gives right to no remedy in Thai law, but if the same facts occur in England, okay, and English law applies, then the victim will have remedy under the doctrine, under the, the doctrine of, let's say, jurors or doctrine of undue infants. So in, Engl in English law, they have the doctrine of jurors and they have also the, the doctrine known as the doctrine of undue infants. We have a few cases which involves, you know, the, the contract made after the threats. The threat like this, the threat that when A makes a threat on B, forcing B to make a contract, otherwise A will press a criminal charge against B, something like that. We can see that if English law applies, the victim will have some remedy, okay? And then the doctrine of duress, the doctrine of undue influence, but not in Thai law. So we can see that Thai law is plucked with some limitations. So that's why I try to say that English law okay, grants a greater degree of remedy than in Thai law, but you will not see the picture right now. You will have correct understanding about this maybe next week when we talk about English law. Right? So that's it, Minda. That's it for the, the principle of law of jurists. We shall, we shall have a break for about 10 to 15 minutes and after that, 
We will come to the second part of my lecture this morning. We will talk about the doctrine of mistake. หลักกฎหมายเรื่องความสัมพันธ์ผิดโอเคเจ้า good luck and see you in a few moments. Thank you.